Hello, everybody. Welcome to our information session on the color vowel chart and the color vowel approach. I'm Karen Taylor. Uh, I'm the originator of the color vowel chart. I'm co-author of the color vowel approach, which is a, a book we published about oh, a little while ago uh, that helps teachers connect spoken English to all of the other teaching we do. Now, that last phrase is where I'll stop and pause because Spoken English is something we use constantly, and yet it's almost like the water we swim in. It's hard to notice how we speak or how to convey how we speak. Uh, without training, we often will grab or lurch toward what we think of as rules or prescriptions for how to speak well. Um, but here we are every day using English in the way that we speak, and this is the English that our students need to understand in daily life. So it's been my passion for the last ooh, 22 years uh, to connect spoken English to what we know already in whether it's grammar, writing, all skills, um, specific workplace skills, what have you, and to light up the way English sounds. So um, about 1999, I created the chart. Uh, it was a tool in my own classroom. It solved a problem that I had. You can learn about that problem another time, but it was effective and my students liked it. They talked with it about their other teachers in the program. This was an intensive English program at University of Maryland. And those teachers, we started sharing ideas. Uh, we started sharing that chart at conferences. Um, I'll be showing it to you in just a moment. And it, word spread. And so if you look at who's in the room, you know, a lot of Maryland, Virginia, DC, this is where the chart started and this is where the chart is um, now. It's where our offices are. And yet we reach uh, worldwide. And so we work with uh, the State Department, of the US government through embassies and consulates to reach schools and teachers around the world with a tool that is not just for my English and it's not just for your English. It's for everybody's English without being prescriptive and without deciding whose English is uh, the best because there is no best. Uh, there's only communication as a goal, okay? So I've thrown a lot of ideas into that little intro that should uh, whet your appetite a little bit. And um, I'm sort of looking around, you know, over here in the chat as ideas come along. So I do see, uh, Melissa, that you teach uh, children. Thank you for letting me know. Um, and some other ideas over there, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my presentation. And as you have questions um, that pertain to the presentation, put them right in there. If you have big questions, uh, let's maybe hold on to those till the end uh, so that we can address those all at once. Um, and we'll just go from there, okay? Here we go. All right, so we're here today with uh, teaching English effectively with Color Vowel and Blue Canoe. Uh, I've not mentioned Blue Canoe yet, but my graphic here kind of does a good job of it. The Color Vowel chart is a touchstone for teachers and learners together, right? Um, learners sometimes can use it on their own, but mostly it's a central touch point for both. It helps the teacher and it helps the learner have a common language for how spoken English is organized. Up here is Blue Canoe. Blue Canoe is our app for learners. So anyone who wants to improve their confidence in spoken English, their confidence in pronunciation, uh, their understanding of how English works in the spoken realm, that's what Blue Canoe is for. A little bit more about each of those, okay? The color vowel approach is built around the chart. It's a way of teaching that lays cleanly over what you already do, but we'll see that uh, for some teachers, it actually becomes the way that they teach most things, uh, but it's not going to require your 100% opt-in, but rather um, you can put your, your toe in the pool if you want. So we'll talk about that. Uh, this is a, a collection of brain-based strategies that we use to rewire the language portion of the brain by utilizing other parts of the brain um, through color, movement, through the musical sensation, not exactly singing, but a musical sensation that we trigger through repetition uh, and the visual, of course, in the chart. Okay. We focus on the stressed behavior of English at the word and the phrase level and the vowel sounds that are at the peak of those key words. 
the peak of those key words, right? You can hear e, e, er, the peak of those key words. It's how we listen, actually, and it's how we understand one another is by listening to what we call those peak vowels. Um, and so you'll be hearing a lot about stress today. We've been doing this, of course, for over 20 years in development with lots of wonderful partners, and we've reached over a million learners and all of their teachers. Okay. Uh, we work with, of course, Blue Canoe is our app development team, the Washington Literacy Center, just down the road from the Washington English Center. Uh, we do some collaboration working on literacy, phonics, and color vowel there. We've worked with Peace Corps to create the pronunciation component of their TEFL curriculum. We work with Intercombio Uniting Communities, a wonderful partner that publishes a series of adult ESL books uh, focusing on the immigrant population and the volunteers and teachers who teach them. Um, so we are in their book, um, their books, it's a 12 book series, um, and the State Department uh, who, with whom we collaborate so that uh, English language fellows and uh, regional English language officers have good materials, uh, which is the chart and the support materials that we provide to teachers around the world. I'm going to kind of move over this. I've already mentioned it a bit. We do, we do use voice recognition with artificial intelligence in Blue Canoe. That's very exciting because we've trained it to focus in on those stressed vowel sounds to get down the kind of 80% concept of what makes us intelligible and comprehensible. So it's not that we have to have every piece in place, but if you have those stresses in place with the right vowel sound, you're going to be understood well enough most of the time. Okay, color vowel feedbacks included in there through the use of pronunciation lessons, games, videos, and quizzes, and a very powerful dictionary. All right, so let's talk briefly about who's English once again. Um, before I hit record, I mentioned, you know, that it's not about my English. It's not about yours. It's about how we all communicate. Um, so if we turned on all of the microphones right now and had a conversation, uh, we'd hear a variety of accents for sure, wouldn't we? They might be regional. They might be foreign accents, uh, all kinds of accents. And, and every one of us has one, okay? Our accents are each influenced by where we grew up, who spoke to us when we were young and who was meaningful to us. Right? It's partly uh, influenced by our age, our gender, our culture, our interests, and our work. So how do we go about teaching pronunciation when there are so many varieties? We focus on the intersection, how it is that we are mutually comprehensible to one another, and by turn, what it is that breaks communication. What is the deal breaker of that comprehensibility that we share? So if you've ever traveled, um, you know, I'll give you an example. I think I, I watched um, a movie once that was filmed in Scotland and everybody spoke Scottish English. And it took me about the first 10 minutes of the movies of the movie to, to tune in. And suddenly I understood what was being said. Have you ever had that sensation? You know, so it's that kind of like, well, it's not that they're not comprehensible. It's just, I need to make a little mental adjustment. Who knows what the brain's doing at that moment? <laughs> but we're very interested in that. And we're interested in if these two people are in the room or these two groups are interfacing, or if it's a diversity of speakers, what is it that our brains allow us to do to tune in? And what do we have to do in language to be understood? Okay, so we'll be focusing on that as what we teach. And every one of us can teach this regardless of uh, your accent or what you've been told about your accent, whether you've been told it's standard or non-standard, or if you speak multiple varieties, uh, they're all valid in the eyes of color vowel. We use this to organize and to understand the ways that we speak. So and now let's we'll shift over to the question of learners. I've been focusing on us, the teachers for a while. What do English learners need when it comes to learning spoken English? And that, by the way, is sort of the calling card of the learner when they go out to find that job or they go to, you know, get that next opportunity or to talk to somebody who has a place of authority, their accent and their ability to make themselves understood is right there on display. They need ways to organize spoken English. 
before they actually can speak, they have to be able to hear and kind of make sense of the stream of speech. So when I say organize, I mean, how can a learner know when one word ends and the next begins? Notice how that whole sentence was connected, how one word ends and the next begins. Where were the words in there? And how do you know that? And what if you're not literate? Can you still tell where the words begin and end? And how? So a non-literate native speaker of English will know what the words were in that sentence. And yet that's despite the fact that they may not have a strong print base. We want this kind of organization that this learner teaches us to be available to the non-native speaker who's learning English and the low literacy learner of English as well. In our classrooms, we need routines for our students to actually practice the rhythm of English. When I say practice, um, what comes to mind? You know, sort of, I'm opening up that question for you. How much practice do your students get in the classroom? How much practice have they gotten before your classroom? And is it enough? I often find practice is thought of as, you know, yes, it's part of the lesson plan, but we do need to move on. So let's get to the next topic, right? Um, practice needs to be preeminent. It needs to be what learners do with you because they won't get to do it elsewhere with the kind of support and feedback that you can provide. Students need opportunities to be curious about English and have time to ask questions about English. It might strike you, you know, well, what kinds of questions would they ask if they have limited English? But given the right kind of support and a powerful visual touchstone, I see learners ask great questions all the time, even low level learners or extremely high level learners, regardless. They're able to ask the questions that occur to them through what they observe, what they already think about language and what they're perceiving. So I'm going to switch now to the difficulty that a learner faces when they are listening to English and what they're doing when they're organizing spoken English. Uh, a lot of our learners come from languages that have um, five to seven vowel sounds, or say I'll say four to seven vowel sounds. Uh, the majority of the world's languages have between four and seven sounds, and five that are very common that you might recognize are these, a, e, i, o, u. Uh, anybody want to take a guess at what language has those five vowels, a, e, i, o, u? You can put that in the chat. Yeah, if you look in the chat, a, e, i, o, u. So Spanish has those five vowel sounds. Uh, Japanese has those five vowel sounds. And several other languages. I'm just I'm curious. I'd like to see if you have any thoughts over there. Good. Czech has those five vowel sounds. It might have a few more, right? Uh, but yeah, so we, we hear these sounds a lot in other languages. And actually, we hear them carried right over into English a lot of the time. And we think of that as a foreign accent. And that may or may not, depending on a lot of several other factors, impede a student's comprehensibility or even lower than that, their intelligibility, their ability to just be understood at all. Um, and then we think of comprehensibility as how much work does the listener have to do to understand what that person is saying. So those are two sort of partnering concepts, right? Portuguese, thank you. Okay, so if these are the categories that a learner brings to the table, this is this hypothetical we'll work with. If they have these five vowel categories, a, e, i, o, u, which one of these will they choose when they hear a sound um, like hot, hot? They might choose uh, hot, hot, or they might choose hot, hot, a, o, hot, hot. Which one is hat? And which one is hot? <laughs> we can start to say, well, gosh, these boundaries are different than our boundaries. We need a, a, a hat that's not hot because hot is too much like hot, 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 right? So in other words, they're traversing these boundaries that we have in English and we need them to be clearer um, if we're to, to understand. And I say we, you know, we teachers are prepared to understand our students uh, when they speak a lot of the time. 
But I'm, when I say we, uh, and when we need to understand, I'm actually including all of the naive speakers and listeners out there. Um, by naive, I mean uh, a lot of times they're monolingual speakers who don't have a lot of strategies for accommodating uh, a student with, a, with what I'll call a heavy accent. And so uh, when that person, that listener is in a place of power or they're a gate holder, uh, like they have something the learner needs, say at a drugstore or going to Home Depot, uh, they're the ones that lean and say, what? I don't understand you. Uh, so the naive listeners who we need to teach with, with in mind, right? Our learner needs to be successful uh, going out into the world and, and having these interactions. Um, there's plenty of work we do with native speakers to increase their comprehensibility and, and their uh, flexibility with listening to different accents. But today we're focusing on what we can do to prepare learners to be more successful out in the world, right? So here are these five A, E, I, O, U, and I've placed these approximately in the way that they uh, confuse uh, English listeners who hear these accented vowels and also the speakers who hear these words, right? So it's about perception and production. Um, take the word pepper, pepper. If I use this, uh, and I'll refer to Spanish because it's a language I speak. So if we take pepper and we use the Spanish version of that vowel, it's pepper, 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 which if you listen to it closely, it starts to sound like uh, paper. Now, if you're watching my mouse, I'm circling over these phrases and you may be wondering what they mean. Each of these phrases represents a vowel sound. And it's not difficult to know which one they represent because the same sound is, is in both words. So red, pepper, both have e eh in it. And that is the vowel sound e. Eh. So I'll ask you whether you're with your camera on or not to take out your hand and I'm going to start sort of um, indoctrinating you into the method that we use with learners to raise awareness in multiple parts of the brain rather than just listening through our first language brain, the hand will help light up these other parts of the brain. So we have red, pepper, eh. And you should hear a kind of a sensation of assonance, the same vowel sound three times, red, pepper, eh, right? What about gray day? Gray day, a, right? We hear that sound in both of those words. So these are the anchor phrases of the color vowel chart. And we can start to say, hmm, if a learner says pepper, 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 are they saying gray day paper? Or are they saying red pepper, 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 pepper? Can you hear that ambiguity in there? It starts to be tricky. Now mix that with a rhythm in their speech that may not match what we do in English, um, as well as some consonant troubles and you have a learner now who's having some difficulty. Then confidence starts pitching downward and they become less and less um, interested in taking risks about speaking. So we find that the moment the chart comes out, learners are relieved because suddenly there's a way to say, oh my goodness, these are the vowel sounds of English. I have at least this now to start with. I can name them. I can say things like, hmm, um, green T E and silver pin I are difficult for me to uh, distinguish. And they can say that in their way. They may not use that grammar or those words, but they'll say, you know, teacher, uh, what is the difference between green and silver? And now we can have a dialogue. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to each of the sounds briefly, again, as a, a bit of a glimpse of what learners experience. Um, each of those phrases has a corollary image, and we use these images in Blue Canoe, our app. We also use it in all of our instructional materials, and our trained teachers receive these images in a digital image kit that you can then use in your PowerPoints and all of the materials that you teach with. Okay, This is green tea. E, you can try that with me. Green T E. So we're using time with our hand extending, with our arm going out, and that gives us time to listen. Silver pin I. Silver pin I. Gray day A. Gray day A. Red pepper E. Red pepper E. Black 
cat ah black cat ah olive sock ah olive sock ah and here we have hat and hot right auburn dog ah i'm going to go a little more quickly now just so you're familiar with them turquoise toy oi orange door or rose boat o wooden hook o blue moon o a cup of mustard a purple shirt er brown cow ow and white tie i now every word of english has a color vowel it's located at the stressed syllable so if I say purpose, purpose, per -er -er -er, that's a purple shirt word. And if we have the word, uh, this is May, May is the month of May, that is a gray day word. Let's try a couple of others. I think you remember some of these and some of the images will light up for you. Okay, let's try January, January, ja -a -a -a. that's the stress syllable. Okay, January. What color vowel would that be? Any guesses? You might be coming down to black cat. So in other words, we're already starting to organize what we hear. Black cat, January. Uh, notice that helps the learner now know that it's not January, okay? Uh, which is a temptation for a lot of speakers. Um, and then when that starts being pronounced in that way, it throws off the cadence, and now we have some intelligibility problems, okay? So every word of English has a place, has a color based on this, the main stress, the primary stress, okay? We build all of these color vowels into Blue Canoe with those images so that the learner can tap on any vowel at any time and remind themselves of the sounds of English. Um, and then our games revolve around that. There is a free basic version of Blue Canoe that you and your learners can download, and then they have access to the chart at all times through the images, okay? The free version does have these images. It does not have the dictionary, and it has a limited number of lessons um, and, and, and today's plan, okay? I won't, I'll be showing you a little bit later on. Uh, we do have a separate presentation on Blue Canoe, um, but today's presentation is focusing mostly on the method. Okay, you may be curious to know what this starts to do in the classroom. And I thought this is an opportunity to show you uh, one glimpse of a teacher and a tutor uh, working together. This tutor is helping the learner with, a, I think it's vocabulary homework or preparing for some test that the tutor did not choose. Uh, so the learner's working through this. The learner's a middle schooler, he's Japanese. And he's about to say this word at the very beginning of the video. It comes fairly quickly. Uh, so that's why I kind of primed you for it. But he also because he mispronounces it. And I want you to notice what the teacher does with color vowels, uh, not to correct exactly, but to provide guidance for a self-correction. Okay, so here we go. Imagine how this word might be mispronounced for just a moment. All right, let's take a look, see what happens. And she could hear the in the tears in her voice downstairs. Okay. What if I tell you that this word is gray day? Gray day? Mm-hmm. Pay patience. Yeah. She couldn't believe this many people were here to see her. She was a no novice. Novice. Which one? No bice. Okay, I'm gonna tell you that it's an olive sock word. Olive sock. Olive sock. No bice. That's right. Mm -hmm. Most new performers never had this large of a globe. What's this word? Globe. That word is brown cow. Crown. Yep. Brief, but pretty powerful, right? Yeah. I'm going to stop that there.
There we go. So these are the three words that came up in the learner's experience that moment, right? Uh, novice, impatience, and crowd. Um, it goes both ways. You know, they might encounter a word during class. Uh, they don't know how to say it. You can let them know what color it is and they're able to move forward. Or say a learner who's preparing for a presentation and they know they need to say these keywords correctly. They look them up in the dictionary and now they know that novice is stressed on the first syllable. Olive, sock, novice, right? Gray, day, impatience. And so we also use the arm to create the time on the vowel that is characteristic of English and that is not characteristic of many other languages. Spanish, for example, does not spend that time on vowel. We have stress in Spanish, but it's pitch based. It goes up in voice, but not out in time. So we're really uh, bringing them into a new way of thinking of rhythm that's very phys physical, kinesthetic, and they can put into their bodies. It actually carries through to gesture that we use all the time, whether it's in our faces, our hands, our bodies, okay? Um, happy to take any questions here in the chat because typically people do have st questions starting to bubble up. So feel free to go into the chat, by the way, okay? Great. So speak spoken English is stress timed. Uh, that's the particular characteristic of English. It means that uh, we secretly already seem to know uh, without being aware of it that there's one syllable that receives more time, uh, more volume, Okay, and a pitch that changes uh, over the others. And this is a way to kind of get a fresh view and a fresh ear on stress if you're not aware of it yet. Uh, take a look at these three words. They, they look all the same, right? Except for the last two letters. So from a learner perspective, this looks like photograph, photograph ick and photograph-er. Now, where's the stress in photograph? Photograph. Take your hand and see if you can mark it by coming outward on the stress syllable. Photograph, right? Photograph. So the stress is on the first syllable. And in the color vowel method, we underline the stressed vowel sound. So we know that peak vowel sound, okay? Photograph. Is it the same in photographic? Photographic. Photographic. Is it photographic or photographic or photographic? Or photographic, right? Photographic. And how do we know that? And how is a learner supposed to know that? There's nothing written in our language that indicates where the stress is. So how would they know unless your teacher taught you <laughs> where the stress is or that your teacher maybe um, raise your awareness that there's this thing called stress that we have to listen for. So not only do they not know where the stress is, they actually may come from a language that doesn't use stress the way we do. And so it's not something that they notice. So we have to raise awareness in creative and consistent ways, photographic, okay? Then we have this third one um, is a photographer. Photographer, it's a very reasonable guess. There's no reason why, I don't know, it might not be, uh, but it might be, <laughs> right? So we, do we say photographer, 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 uh, photographer, photographer. And yet a learner coming from a language that has penultimate stress, for example. There's some languages that have uh, the, the second to last syllable is always the one that's stress. Photographer, okay? Uh, that's going to be the way they render it because that's really all they have to go by until we raise their awareness that English is a stress-timed language. And you're going to have to pay attention to what you hear as you learn words. And we need to have ways to put those down on paper in ways that we can remember where the stress is, like novice, right? So here's photographer, no, photographer, okay? The next question we ask, as soon as we know what color, sorry, as soon as we ask what, where the stress is, we ask what color that word is, okay? So photograph, pho, whoa, 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 photograph. If you remember any color vowels that you saw earlier, 
uh, you might remember, oh, oh, Rose, Rose Boat Photograph. And now we have a little mnemonic uh, that first of all, just helps us kind of hear that stress sound again, Rose Boat Photograph, but it's also going to be where we put this word when we move to our graphic organizer. The color vowel organizer is the companion for the learner every day, every lesson, whatever the class is. It could be a chemistry class that they're taking. It could be English class, but they need ways to write down important words that they want to be able to use. So they can ask questions. They can give presentations. They can be the ones in charge. Okay, Photographic, photographic. Remember my hat and hot, ha, 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 color vowel? Doesn't take long. Learners pick this up really quickly. Black cat photographic. Now, if they don't know the difference between a ah and ah because they hear them the same, they might guess. They might say, is it olive? And I'd say, well, listen to it. I say photographic. If it's olive, it would be photographic. Photographic, photographic. I could imagine some speakers of English using olive. I don't, I use black, but both of those are, you know, we could consider them but I'll let them know, I use black. Notice that I didn't say olive is completely wrong. What about uh, if somebody guesses gray photo, how would it sound? Gray day photographic. There I would say, you know, I, it, that is not a way I've ever heard anybody say it. Um, I'm going to tell you that that's a black cat word. So we're able to guide a student without being prescriptive we can consider, you know, how does that sound? Oh yeah, they might use that in British English, for example. Um, but then there are other color vowels that simply aren't going to be possible. Photographic is not the way anybody says that word, okay? What about photo uh, uh, photographer? There's that other sound that was just close by with hat and hot, olive sock photographer. For learners, this is an epiphany that they now have a way to note and to see how a word sounds without all of the deep processing involved in phonetics transcrip transcriptions, which is a whole separate language, right? You have to know the transcription language in order to make sense of it. You have to have something to write on in order to make sense of transcriptions. Okay? And with this, we can either write it, we can use images, or we can talk about it and simply say, that's a black word, black cat photographic. Okay? What we know about intelligibility and comprehensibility in English is that stressing the correct syllable is more important than producing each sound correctly. Learners often come to the table with misconceptions about how English should be spoken, and they can end up uh, over enunciating every syllable in an attempt to be understood. And at best, they might sound um, somehow stilted or even robotic. And at worst, it may conflate with some of the patterns of their first language to make them really quite incomprehensible, despite their greatest efforts. Have you ever had a learner who seems to try too hard on every word they say? That sometimes is what's happening here. So they've not been tuned into the secret of spoken English, that we have this thing called stress, that it creates a rhythm, and that that rhythm is what gets them through the door for the job interview to get that job or to get that special opportunity or to communicate with that important person, okay? Stress isn't just for words. So it's not just photograph or photographic. It's whole sentences like this one. A fraction has a numerator and a denominator. A fraction has a numerator and a denominator. Ba 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 ba. Okay. There's a rhythm to that that's built around the stresses. We also have phrasing in there that revolves around the stresses. A fraction has a numerator and a denominator. So English likes to pull its thought groups according to where the content words are, the key words, faction, fraction, numerator, denominator, right? And then each of those words has a stress location that isn't marked usually. Is it deno denominator? Is it denominator uh, or denominator? Oh, yeah. Then we can identify those color vowels. A fraction has a numerator and a denominator. Okay. Not only will our learners be able to hear these kinds of sentences, say in the math class they need to pass, okay, but they might also then be able to ask those questions. Like, what, which one is the numerator? Which one is the denominator? You can imagine that asking these questions 
requires a, a level of confidence in even saying the words of the questions if they're going to ask that question. Our learners who are a little too quiet might have all the words they need and none of the confidence that's necessary. We build sentences like this into Blue Canoe and provide lots of practice. Okay. The app, by the way, I'll just mention is built for adult learners with established literacy. So if you're getting excited about the app, I just wanna say that. Uh, so that if you're working with younger students, uh, it's just not the interface for, for students under the age of 14, I would say. Um, and it's also, you'd have to have a lot of scaffolds in place to work with low literacy learners. I do have teachers who use Blue Canoe with low literacy learners, but I want you to know that it's designed for literate uh, learners with about an intermediate vocabulary and above, okay? The ColorVal organizer though is for everybody in one way or another. It's uh, for, let's say learners from mm, intermediate and above or all literate adult learners. Uh, this is a piece of paper, right? Um, it can be a spreadsheet if you're working online with learners who are comfortable, you can do it as a spreadsheet. But the point is that you have a place to put words. If you're working with young learners, age three and four, or grades one, two, three, these will become word walls. Each of these colors becomes its own pocket chart. So you can collect words and put them under green tea or blue moon. Let's start to see what that looks like. So here's that impatience under gray day impatience. Learner turns to their organizer, writes it down so they can reinforce this at home and practice. Novice, crowd, we can take other words. You remember the, those memes out there that talk about, you know, um, oh, I learned, let's see, thorough thought though. I mean, I can't remember them all right now, but it's how these words all look the same. So here's through, blue moon through. How about tough, tough, looks a lot the same, but it's a different color vowel, a cup of mustard, tough, though, or thought, or thorough purple shirt, thorough, okay. thought. For some of us is olive sock thought and for others it's Auburn dog thought. And if you don't hear the difference, don't worry. We, uh, we really uh, get into that when we train you so you know which one is for you, okay? Uh, for those of you who think, what do you mean? Of course, this is Auburn. We can also talk with you about that through training but these two are very similar vowels. So I'll say for now, okay? Though. Try these, photograph, photographer, photographic. Do you remember? Photograph, photograph. We'll go with rose, boat, though, rose, boat, photograph. This is practice. This is what practice looks like, okay? So the learning or the discovery moment for that learner that you saw in the video was, oh, novice. But if we don't write it down or create opportunities for practice, that'll be a one-off aha and it'll dissipate within oh, minutes, seconds, really. If he writes it down, now he has novice in his organizer, he can go home tonight and review each category that has a word in it. When he comes here, he's already learned with his teacher how to have a nice ah sound in olive and sock, olive, sock, novice. And if he's not yet there, he's saying something like olive, sock, novice, at least he's now got the right stress and we can continue to work on the quality of that sound. Okay. So it takes us a long way, even when used lightly. Okay. Before long, within a week of lessons, if you meet with somebody twice a week or three times a week, uh, this organizer starts to fill up and we then store it. And where that goes is ideally into a notebook, a binder. And in time, we're prepared to then do spelling exploration which is a flipped approach to spelling that's based on sound first. So rather than going by phonics rules, we complement that approach with what do you hear and how many words are in that category anyway, okay? So the word though and photograph are there with rows and boat. How many spelling patterns do you see in rows? I already see one, two, three, 
And then we can decide if the O of photograph is different from the O with the silent E of rose or not. Okay. And so spelling exploration is an entire workshop where we introduce you to this flipped approach. Very powerful for younger learners, uh, definitely powerful for adult learners, where the curiosity grows through your course. And then about a mm, little over the halfway point, three quarters of the way through your course, you start having enough words to do spelling exploration. And that's about when they're the most interested because the first part of your course, they will be fascinated that they have a way to move forward with their spoken English and they'll listen with more confidence as well, okay? What we've been doing here is looking at a way to experience spoken English in the other parts of the brain. Why? This red dot ex expresses or represents uh, Broca's area, which is the language part of the brain. This is the part of the brain that is responsible for first language acquisition, speech and sounds and perception. Okay, so everything involving sound is coming through Broca's area. And it's a bit of a bulldog when it comes to a foreign language that you're trying to learn or a second language. And so when it's in the bulldog phase, if you're thinking in terms of language, it will impose all of its patterns and its rules and its sounds on the second language learning experience. And that's, that's part of the interference that we experience when we try to learn a second language. When we use the hand like photographer, photographer, it actually bypasses Broca's very briefly for seconds, but powerful seconds. So the learner is able to experience that word in a more target-like way before it zooms right back over to Broca's for speech processing. If this sounds sort of too magical, it's, it's really very evident in a lot of the work that's done with brain injury, um, stroke survivors, and so forth. So this is all research-based and transferred over to the second language learning experience. Okay? When you heard rose, boat, though, photograph, and you start hearing that, oh, 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 we are engaging the musical brain, which is over here and both sides of the brain actually light up. Okay. Suddenly we have a way to address words that I kind of call these the boutique questions. You know, how many times has some student come up to you every semester and they ask a question like, um, sheep, ship, sheep, sheep, what's the difference? How do I say these two words? The two words might change, right? But always somebody comes up and has, you know, two tricky words or three tricky words. And we try our best to help them out and they walk away and feel a little better. Um, but do you sense that they really solved the problem? Are we able to solve the problem? Can we at least say what color these are? Sheep and ship, ears, years, paper, pepper. All of these are words that we can address on the chart itself, okay? Um, so I'm going to switch over to the chart for a moment. Take a look at the boundaries um, that you see here. These are organized according to where they occur in the vocal tract. Um, what I'm doing with my mouse is the equivalent of moving your jaw down. So if you just start from uh, green with a smile, E, 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 and then just lower your jaw, but keep that smile, yeah. So we can actually come down and find a really nice black sound just by moving down into it, rather than saying hat, and they say hat. You say no hat, and they say hat. Okay, we can move down, yeah, hat, and they can do that too. That's the kinesthetic and musical visual brain at work outside of Broca's. So when you study with us, we align you to this new way, this sort of intuitive way of bypassing Broca's over and over so that learners can experience what the target is and take it back over and, and kind of tame that bulldog of Bro Broca's area, okay? Paper and pepper we discussed earlier. Um, we start by letting the learner know, you know, paper is gray and pepper is red. And then if we still need to see what the difference is, or they're still saying pepper, pepper right here on the line, you can watch my mouse and say, well, gray paper moves up toward green, a, a, whereas a eh, pepper stays in one place, a, eh, a, eh. my jaw is not moving. So we start to illuminate how each of these sounds behaves by using the chart, the design of the chart with these watermarks that you may or may not have noticed before. They all mean something when they're needed. And we teach you a way of teaching where you explain less 
they ask more and they practice more. So it's a discovery-based approach. Um, you can finally bring down the amount of teacher talk in your classroom. The chart invites all kinds of questions, not just about vowels, but about all of spoken English, consonants included, okay? Um, learners know that this carries a lot for them. And so it's extremely engaging. Okay. Blue Canoe provides videos that light up the chart a bit more with some of those little movements I just showed you. Uh, so vowel yoga is what we call that. It's, it's a, sort of a shorthand for the ways that we use our arms and hands as teachers to cut down on the amount of time we speak and to increase the amount of discovery that our learners can do with the chart. It also allows us, by the way, I'll just mention, it allows all of us to speak English naturally without having to um, structure a kind of artificial teacher's English. So, you know, if, if you've ever heard yourself um, over pronouncing a word, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing we bring that right down so that you can actually model the way that you have coffee with a friend and you actually model your own natural English because now the chart, and I keep kind of referring to the chart behind me, I'll go ahead and post it now. Um, the chart is this constant reference in class that allows you to say reference is a red pepper word, eh. Okay, I'll go ahead and spotlight myself so that you can see what I'm doing when I do this kind of work. Okay, yeah. So you start to get used to using the chart, referring to the chart, and learners do too. Uh, our materials allow you to put a poster in the classroom. Um, so we have physical materials. We also have a digital teacher starter kit, uh, whether you're teaching uh, online or face-to-face -face, and whether you are outside the United States or in the US, uh, those are two considerations. If you're outside the United States, we offer the digital teacher starter kit because uh, anybody who's ever tried to ship something outside the US knows how expensive shipping is. And it simply makes our materials almost cost more in shipping than the materials themselves. So the digital teacher starter kit is if you are outside the US. Um, I think, who, I can't remember quite who was in Japan, but if you have a friend coming from the US, you know they can carry materials with them and kind of talk to your friends, uh, those of you in other countries, okay? But the chart is provided in a number of formats, including the poster, which is essential because you're going to be referring to it constantly. Um, in a way that saves time. I'll just say that right now. Uh, if you always feel like you don't have enough time, uh, the color vowel chart actually alleviates all of those questions about oh, how do you say this word and even how is it spelled? Because you can now get that sound orientation, that organization, and then wait on spelling for this later time that I train you to notice. Okay, uh, so, and there are some mini moments when you can do some little mini explorations of spelling when, when really needed or when demanded by the students. Uh, so it's turning into a, a very strong student-centered classroom. I'd like to turn for a few minutes to, uh, and we're getting toward the end of our time, so I'm going to take questions, but I'm going to show you what our training program looks like. Um, this is a leveled program. If you're interested in teaching in this way, um, we start with what we call the level one experience, and that comes in two parts, okay? The two parts are a basic program, and that's an on-demand video-based program with videos that I've made for you and quizzes that Jennifer and I have made it in order to make sure that, you know, certain concepts are reinforced and that you get practice in noticing stress. It may be something you've never really thought about before, and that's, that's a very common thing that we as speakers of English don't have to notice stress. Uh, we may be very aligned to uh, spelling rules or you know, we may have our students alphabetize word, but we've never really thought about stress. So we train you in this sensitivity to stress and we train you in the methods that I've been using uh, to some extent today, okay? So that would be a program called Color Vowel Basics. Let me just pull out my little slide here for you. I'll show it to you this way. Um, Jennifer is going to provide you with a link to our basics program. You could do that today, this week. You could be done um, in a couple of days if you were really excited. Okay? And that provides you with a knowledge of, of what the color vowel approach is in its most fundamental form. Um, there's a lot you can go and do with it, but we highly recommend then moving into the level one cert where we work with you 
directly live. And those are four live meetings in our six hour live training and practicum course. Okay. So you meet four times over four weeks, 90 minutes each with a practicum that consists of video based tasks that you submit. You do not have to be um, recording in your classroom. This is all done in your home or in your office or in your classroom alone. So it's not a student teaching practicum at this point. Uh, the level one experience is just you, uh, me, the coach, and uh, the video assist, the video program that I provide you. Okay. Um, so again, this is our video program. This is our live component. Um, and Jennifer has provided you with links so that you can get started there. Okay. Um, I want you to know that if you are interested in Blue Canoe, um, that is a powerful way to take what you do in class with the color vowel chart outside of class to what the learner does with practice on their own. So this part of this sort of figure eight flow is the learning, the discovery, practice, and more discovery. And they come back with more questions. And I've seen this. This is I had, I had to make this graphic because I had to find a way to illustrate what I saw happening with learners, that they were coming in excited about what they had discovered. Uh, we actually run for some of our, our users uh, in groups, we run a WhatsApp chat and they'll post, you know, screen captures of what they discovered in the games and have questions. And so it's, it's just a very engaging way to keep the learning going around the clock, okay? At this time, I'm going to turn to questions. And I know Jennifer has addressed a lot of those. Um, but we would like to, you know, invite any detailed questions about what you've learned today, about steps to move forward with, um, or applications that maybe I haven't addressed today. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, are there any questions at this point that you want to raise uh, in, to my attention? No, nothing at this point. Um, some, I think we already took care of one question about spelling. And uh, we just got one from Claire. When you're presenting the color vowel chart to a learner for the first time, do you explain how the chart maps onto the mouth? In other words, does that seem like a necessary part of introducing the chart or is that bonus information you can talk about later? Uh, Claire, you already have the language. <laughs> Whether you know it or not, it's brilliant. Uh, that bonus information is what we hold on to. Um, I, I train you to basically say only what has to be said and so in terms of explanation, very little needs to be said. Um, at the, the most basic level, I can go into the lowest level classroom and say, green tea e. You do it. And they say green tea e. So I can start right in with simply presenting these vowels. Learners don't have to know immediately why they're doing something. You know, when they finish that first presentation, I can wait. I say, these are the sounds of English. Sometimes I don't even say vowel. I just say sounds because, you know, too many words if we're talking about the lowest level learners. And then, believe it or not, they actually will come up with questions. And if they don't, I have a lesson plan in our book that actually walks you through in a, in a pretty fail-safe lesson plan that, again, reduces explanation, maximizes presentation and practice. Okay, because we, we tend to talk too much. It's just the fact of, of teachers. Um, and, and so we, I, we identify when it is we need to explain, but how much. It's a little bit Socratic, if you want to think of it that way, that we answer the question that's asked, but only so much so that another question can be asked. And if not another question is asked, then we move on with our lesson plan. And so in this way, the color vowel chart and, and what we do with the approach is alongside your lesson plan. We don't teach color vowel. You use color vowel to illuminate a part of English that typically isn't represented in lessons. You keep going with your lesson plan, uh, whether it's a life skills, whether it's reading, you know, what have you. But color vowel is there to answer these questions or to have a student ask a question, okay? I hope that that's helpful. If it sounds mysterious, it gets much clearer in training. Um, I, think, I think it's a game changer. I've watched it change classrooms. I've heard back from teachers over the last 20 years, you know, this has revolutionized my teaching. Um, it's, it's a small shift, but it is a very serious shift in the paradigm of what it means to teach. And, and learners really can be the ones who lead the questions and they do. 
great. Thank you. Hey, Karen, can I offer a um, my own little testimonial? Sure. <laughs> I, I uh, encountered the color vowel chart, um, oh gosh, seven years ago. Um, and uh, I started using it in my um, community college classes. And this sort of heart back to the question about spelling. Um, it was truly powerful for my Arab speaking students. I had a lot of um, students from Saudi at the time and um, who just struggle with the way that written English and spoken English do not mesh. And by using the color vowel chart instead of IPA and doing spelling exploration with them, it was, you know, just as Karen said, sort of the just in time um, approach, you know, when they're ready and they start going, but but how do I know what color to use? Then we start looking at the spelling exploration and it was transformative for them. Students who had always struggled with spelling and writing really made significant um, improvement, even though I was in a, I was teaching them speaking and listening. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to mention a, a couple of things as we finish up. You'll receive a follow-up email with many of the links that Jennifer has posted here in the chat. Uh, but I wanted to just let you know that I think it's tomorrow, Friday, tomorrow's Friday. We have uh, about twice a month, we hold a session called Fridays at Five that we launched at the beginning of the pandemic when uh, so many things changed for so many and we were all at home. And so Fridays at Five is a gathering of educators, of teachers, uh, both those who are color valve trained and those who are brand new to it, like you, um, who come together to hear and learn and participate in conversation around um, whether it's teaching with technology, using color valve, et cetera. And so tomorrow's Fridays at five session is on the topic of tips for teachers who work with Brazilian speakers of English, meaning uh, Brazilian Portuguese speakers. And this is part of our series. Uh, we do have a whole series that's based on a, you know, different first languages. So we recently had one on uh, working with Japanese speakers of English that some of you will be interested in. Um, we have a session, uh, recently we had a session on Spanish uh, and then we also have Arabic coming up. But tomorrow is Brazilian Portuguese and we'll have others in the future. But to sign up for those and for other events coming up, I'll give you just one more link. Um, before we sign off. I already did, Karen. Okay, there it is. Just one more time. <laughs> Just one more time. But look for that Fridays at five. Uh, it's going to be great. And it's nice because tomorrow's is kind of special. We have Dr. Robin Barr, who is our resident linguist. Um, she basically works, she, I've worked with her closely over the last 20 years to vet everything we do with the chart in terms of phonology so that this is not uh, just a, you know, I did make it over a weekend in 1999, but I vetted it against the, pheno the phonology that we know from science and how sound works. And so I can tell you that, you know, she makes sure that we're on target that way. And she's speaking tomorrow. She'll share a bit of the phonology of uh, Brazilian Portuguese, how it differs from European Portuguese, or Portuguese Portuguese, um, and also then what English learners who are from Brazil really struggle with. Um, we then have Gilson Hosanna, who's one of our color vowel teachers from Brazil. He learned English with color vowel himself, and he's a teacher of English. And so he's going to share a bit of his journey and the strategies he uses with his learners. And then we have Dorley Piskey, who is an experienced EFL, ESL teacher uh, from a number of countries, but partly uh, Brazilian. And she'll share some strategies on teaching uh, vowels that that are close to the nasal sounds of Portuguese. So really fun stuff. We go a little deep, we get linguistic -y, uh, and we have a great time. Okay. I look forward to seeing some of you again tomorrow. Uh, we do have a session. We'll send you a link. Um, if you want to learn more about Blue Canoe, we have ways for you to pilot Blue Canoe with your learners. Um, so just watch for that in the email. Okay. Any final questions before we sign off? I'm so happy to see you here today. Thank you for coming. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, this was great. Oh, thank you. Thanks.